Hi, good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Thank you for taking the time to join me in this session as we look at the beauty opportunities in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia has been the um, microcosm of global development and we are seeing more businesses centering their expansions and their developments within the region, which brings us to actually want to understand a little bit more about what Southeast Asia is really all about, what the beauty trends are like and what are the opportunities that really sit within the um, region itself. But just before we get started, I just want to briefly introduce also our company, Mintel, in case some of you are not so familiar with us. So Mintel stands for Market Intelligence. So we are the world's leading market intelligence agency. What we do is we offer comprehensive reports, data. We also track new product launches globally. With all of that resources and information, our global team of analysts like myself, we basically analyze all this information, data, and also together with our market experience and observations, we then generate recommendations, insights on the consumer and product landscape for different beauty companies to address different business needs to help with different business growth. So in today's presentation itself, we are looking at two main areas within the Southeast Asia region. Firstly, the retail landscape, as well as the product landscape to really gain insights into the region and understand what are the opportunities sitting within the region for companies, for brands to really tap into. Within the retail landscape, we are looking at the retail revolution of both the online and offline developments and expansion plans within Southeast Asia. When it comes to the product landscape itself, we are seeing how leap category is really leading um, within the region itself and how Hala Beauty has also suggest potential for more growth for businesses to tap into across the whole beauty and personal care category. So to start off, we will have a quick overview of what Southeast Asia is really made up of. And our focus is on these six countries, which include Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. So we'll look at some of the uh, actual facts of Southeast Asia, like the population, the demographics, and the overview of some key growth and developments within the region itself. Now, Southeast Asia is, of course, a very interesting region altogether. It's probably made up of the most diverse consumer mix um, coming across from different consumers, coming from different uh, languages, religion, culture, races. So before World War II, Southeast Asia is most known for like a Malay Peninsula. But of course, as time evolved, we now call it just Southeast Asia itself. So it's diverse, like Singapore and Malaysia itself. We are made up of a multitude of uh, ethnic group, like Singapore. Close to 80% of Singapore's population is actually made up of Chinese, 15% Malays, and 7% Indians. Our neighbouring country, Malaysia, half of their population is made up of Malays, 23% Chinese, 12% Indigenous, and 7% Indians. Apart from the population, we look at the gross domestic product in terms of the whole economy of each country within Southeast Asia. So we see that Indonesia, of course, is one of the biggest uh, country within Southeast Asia, accounting for about 263 million people as of May 2017. But their average gross uh, GDP is only about 3,500 US dollars. In contrast, Singapore has one of the smallest population of about 5.7 million people as of May 2017, but we record one of the highest GDP um, this year of about $52,000 uh, US dollars itself. So it kind of reflects the uh, development of each country. Although we are sitting within the same region, each country is, is different, which brings us to a very interesting insights to how brands can actually really penetrate into the Southeast Asia region. Now, with such a diverse uh, consumer mix, of course, reaching out to our consumers in Southeast Asia is definitely looking a little bit different across these six key countries. So what we see here is um, the different kind of advertising source, two main ones, television or online. So we see that traditional advertising channels like television is still very much favorable and uh, effective, I would say, for developing markets like uh, Philippines or even like Indonesia, as we can see from the orange bar itself that represents television. Close to half of the consumers in Philippines or even in Indonesia they first learn of products that they want to buy through television advertisements, through, through any kind of uh, marketing made through television. Whereas in countries like Singapore, um, even in um, 
Vietnam itself, right, we are starting to see people buying more, getting more exposed through uh, online platforms, online advertisements itself. And of course, technology has become a huge part of um, everyone's lifestyle today. So a lot of our social media platform has ultimately turned into not just a personal usage kind of a thing, it's also been used by brands for advertising purposes or even like a B2C kind of a channel to reach out to consumers. Facebook is actually a very well-received, very popular uh, social media channel in Southeast Asia. So we see from the data here is that 77% of consumers in Southeast Asia they have at least like one brand page on Facebook itself, so they follow a particular brand page that they really, really like. Close to 40% of these online consumers in Southeast Asia, in fact, has actually made purchases through this kind of uh, marketing channels on Facebook itself. So it goes to show that Facebook is one of the effective channels for online marketing to reach out to consumers in Southeast Asia. Not just that, Instagram in recent days has also grown uh, quite a big fair bit in Southeast Asia. We are starting to see more sponsored advertisements on the Instagram application itself to reach out to consumers, to link consumers to their online site, to encourage consumers to actually make purchase. So again, we are seeing more of this growth of uh, online channels to actually reach out to consumers to translate ultimately into sales for this kind of uh, beauty businesses. So we talk about how um, online marketing, online trend is really picking up. So we actually kind of have this projection coming from uh, Google and uh, Tomasic Place and BI Intelligence kind of a report. They have projected that about eight years from now, the size of the e-commerce market of Southeast Asia is actually projected to reach 88 billion US dollars by 2025. So as of this year, it's actually projected to actually hit about 10 billion US dollars. The convenience of uh, internet, um, the abundance of choices and information that's made available for consumers today has actually driven the e-commerce market very aggressively. Not just that, the growth of the middle class um, group of consumers in Southeast Asia as well as the improved infrastructure within the region itself will further boost and drive the e-commerce market in Southeast Asia, which also increase branding publicity for brands, which ultimately translate into sales for these uh, beauty brands as well. So it's not just data that's telling us that we have seen e-commerce giants like Alibaba, even Amazon starting to eye on the Southeast Asia region to expand their businesses within Southeast Asia itself to grow their business. So again, mirroring the whole trend of e-commerce within Southeast Asia and how it's showing a lot of growth uh, potential for beauty companies as well. So moving from the overview, getting a little bit more uh, un uh, understanding of the Southeast Asia region, we first now look at the uh, retail landscape of Southeast Asia itself. Southeast Asia has seen the entrance of a lot of uh, beauty retail giants. Like uh, countries like Thailand, we are starting to see a lot of uh, Japanese retail giants stepping foot into uh, Thailand itself, expanding their business. In 2011, we first saw uh, Zeruha, which is, which is one of uh, Japan's leading uh, drugstore chain, making their investment in Thailand in 2011. Shortly after, Matsumoto Kiyoshi, another leading and renowned uh, retail chain store in Japan itself, also set up their first store in Bangkok in 2015. And one of the latest retail news that we got is that the uh, Japan's renowned ranking site and store at Cosme it's also opening its first store in Bangkok later this year as well. So this is going to show that um, Thai consumers are still very much following very closely the Japanese trend, Japanese uh, routine in, in terms of um, to suit and resonate with them. When we talk about Singapore, Singapore has been the regional hub for a lot of innovation centre, for a lot of beauty companies. Sephora is one of the leading and most influential uh, retailer within Southeast Asia. In fact, the regional headquarters for Sephora is based in Singapore. The Sephora APEC is actually based in Singapore to further expand and grow into the neighbouring countries within Southeast Asia. So we have seen a lot of flagship store opening in Singapore. Sephora is one of them. A lot of Korean companies have also set up their flagship store within uh, Singapore. Sephora's influence is not just on the Western beauty brands and trends, they are starting to introduce also the Korean trends and Korean brands into the market to actually um, influence the overall beauty landscape for Southeast Asia. In Vietnam, 
Right, having ventured into Vietnam market since 2011, Guardian has now opened its 49th store as of uh, April this year. So the store's expansion and addition of space actually provide a platform for local brands to actually display their products, to sell their products, to reach out to consumers. So they are, they are really very supportive of local businesses and they are the key channels really for local business development and expansions. When we talk about Indonesia, we are seeing actually the Thai skincare retailer beauty community entering the Indonesian market in 2015. Beauty community owns uh, a few other brands under them like Beauty Cottage, um, Beauty Buffet as well. They operate close to 300 stores in Thailand and they are starting to grow um, not just locally but even to the neighbouring uh, Southeast Asia looking at markets like Indonesia. So similarly, they are recognising the kind of uh, trend and potential in Southeast Asia itself, really catering more towards the low and middle class income group of consumers. So aside from the uh, brick and mortar stores within Southeast Asia, we are, we are now looking at towards the online platform, how it's actually looking a little bit different now in Southeast Asia um, among consumers. We are seeing more consumers buying a lot more these days, shopping more online, buying more online as what we see on the data here. The orange bar represents 2017 um, percentage of consumers who have actually purchased product online in the past one month. So we see across Southeast Asia in these key markets itself, the growth is definitely there. More consumers are shopping online, they are buying more online as well. In Malaysia, about 70% of respondents, they actually shop in a combination of both online and offline store. And Singapore actually holds a very high potential for e-commerce market altogether and is projected to actually be ultimately worth close to $7.5 billion eight years from now. So with technology being a huge part of everyone's life, it's not just for shopping, it's not just for finding out information through our uh, e-commerce platform. We are hearing more of also the mobile commerce, what we call the uh, M-commerce, because mobile phone is always attached to us. We are not using it just for connectivity, we are using it to also make purchases, to learn more about uh, information of products itself. So here are some actually very interesting uh, examples that we see uh, emerging from uh, within Southeast Asia itself. These are the digital platform that is really up and coming within Southeast Asia. So firstly, in Malaysia, this is an interesting uh, example. They call it the elevator shopping. So very literally, it allows consumers to shop while they are waiting inside the lift. So this is actually established by this company, uh, a lift poster board company called UpButton. So they came up with this uh, board itself that comes together with the NFC board. So consumers while waiting in the elevator in the lift, very conveniently using their mobile phone, they can just simply tap and scan the product that they see the code on the NFC code on the board itself to make purchases while waiting uh, in the lift itself. So a format like that also allow uh, brands to customize promotion to reach out to consumers while in the lift itself. Also in Malaysia, 7-Eleven in Malaysia is starting to offer their store space for online pickup as an online pickup location. So this is part of the group's plan in the expanding e-commerce landscape within the country itself. So we are starting to see how physical stores is really partnering together with online stores in the future of shopping to make shopping to make uh, online shopping or even physical store shopping even more convenient for all consumers in Southeast Asia. In Indonesia, everyone can almost be a shopkeeper today. So franchise has been taken into the virtual reality space, the VR space, as we see the collaboration between Slingshot, a technological company, together with uh, Alpha Mart, which is a Indonesia's biggest retailer. So this uh, model, this format itself, allow consumers to set up virtual store, stock up the augmented reality shelves with the stocks from Alpha Mart itself. So this model is not just uh, a purely a B2C kind of uh, format. What they also do is basically to really empower uh, female entrepreneurs to set up their own business when they still face a little bit of uh, discrimination within their country, but to still be able to run their own business through this kind of a uh, virtual reality kind of a uh, platform. Another interesting example from Indonesia. This is an uh, Indonesian mall, the Super Mall Karawachi. 
So they have actually set up this application using location and contextual data to actually cater, uh, to actually deliver rather very customized information like vouchers, uh, deals, or even event alerts to passing shoppers around the mall itself. So this platform similarly can allow uh, a lot of customization work between the uh, retailers within the mall for shoppers itself. Not just that, data like that actually allows uh, for future customization of future deals according to what consumers are buying, are taking up, so they can actually customize the information, the kind of uh, promotions for shoppers within the mall. In Philippines, uh, Adobo Mall has actually set up um, the very first online shopping mall in Philippines where they house various brands while providing them with the virtual um, storefront itself. So for consumers, it still gives that, it instills in them the confidence to shop through this kind of online shopping mall because they know that um, it is authentic, they are buying from the original brand itself. A format like that, uh, an app like that, really provide the kind of convenience for online shopping, shopping at home, at the comfort of your own home, while giving you the actual experience of browsing through, walking through the shopping mall, just like while you're in the physical mall itself, but except that you're probably sitting down on your bed, really casually browsing through. Um, convenience is there. I think the whole shopping experience is there also for consumers. So we can see even in a market like Philippines, the digital platform is really evolving, looking very different to really reach out to consumers, to bring shopping even closer to consumers. Singapore, not just not recently, they actually launched this new application. It's called the Hot Spotting World. It's a uh, fashion concierge mobile application. So spot and buy, very literally what it means is that today you can simply buy something that you see not just on online store. Today if you see something that you like on a billboard, on a magazine or even on a video itself, you can simply just take a picture of it and it can actually lead you to different uh, related searches. So how is it done? So basically, you can take a picture using your mobile phone, scan the product that you see, say for example, on the magazine and eyeshadow itself. So once you scan the product, the application has this technology, the object recognition technology, that ultimately links it to the product database that they have, that they linked with across uh, a lot of online platform to find the closest search result based on the picture that you took. So for, con for consumers, it's very convenient. They see something that they like, they are led on to uh, a lot of other related products itself. They no longer have to uh, visit a lot of physical stores or search through a lot of online stores to find that particular product that they really want. So again, delivering convenience for consumers. And for brands itself, it is really encouraging brands to really advertise a lot more, increase their uh, awareness, their visibility for consumers, so that when this kind of searches take place, their search result is one of those that is prompted to ultimately translate into sales for beauty brands. So looking at our retail landscape give, gives us a whole idea about both the uh, physical store development as well as the digital platform development. Now we look at some of the product landscape itself. We know that the, uh, we have mentioned a lot of times how diverse uh, consumer mix is really for Southeast Asia. So we are looking at a few uh, launches within Southeast Asia itself, starting from the homegrown brands. So local brands has come a long way within this very fast-paced and competitive beauty industry itself. So some of the brands that we're going to highlight here are brands that have been really successful, not just within the local market itself. They have earned for themselves also the regional or even international presence within the beauty industry and how and why makes them so successful uh, in the beauty industry itself. Allies of Skin, this is a brand from Singapore, established just about four years ago, and they started out with actually only one product, which is the 1A All Day Mask. So the mask itself um, is after two years of a lot of intense uh, R&D work, where they actually claim to be the world's first day mask. So we know how mask is a big trend in the beauty industry, and for them, they are the first non-wash off uh, all-day mask. You can conveniently wear it throughout the day to give you the same uh, hydration level, the same kind of skin booster that your skin will really need. So this product itself, this brand itself, is also one of the first local brands to have make it to the international high-end uh, e-commerce stores in the US, like Neck and Portal, uh, Farfetch itself. What made this brand really successful is the fact that um, they really listen to consumers, they focus a lot on consumer. 
They don't pay for any uh, product reviews, any editorial, editorials. They really let their brand, their product speak for themselves because their brand, their product itself is very easy to use. It basically serves as the backbone of your regular, your existing skincare regime. So you don't have to change any of the skincare regime. You can very conveniently fit in this multifunctional uh, product itself. They recently also just launched the overnight facial, which is very much like a exfoliator. You use it consecutively for two to three nights. It delivers twice the effect of the traditional exfoliator in the market. So it gives you a very complete skin renewal and revitalization of your skin itself. Very much like how you go into a salon for a facial treatment, except that you can now do this at the comfort of your own home. Namu Life is a brand from uh, Thailand. This brand similarly was launched in 2013 itself and it has been a hype ever since. We know whitening is a very big thing uh, among Thai consumers. So they actually came out with this snail white uh, range of products itself formulated with very concentrated ingredients taken from uh, Korea such as the snail secretion filtrate, uh, even like ginseng to help with whitening and even anti-aging. This brand is very successful because they invest heavily on publicity. You cannot miss any of the advertisements around uh, Thailand itself. Right from the airport, along the streets, in the train, you can always see an advertisement from uh, Nambu Life itself. And their presence today is not just within uh, Thailand. They have also successfully entered into other parts of Southeast Asia, like uh, Malaysia, uh, even like uh, the Australian market, China, Singapore, and now even into Sweden and USA itself. This is another very popular brand from uh, Philippines, Human Nature, started in 2008. So how this brand really started was by the founder when they were living in the uh, United States and they realized how the eco-friendly and ethically made products are starting to enter the mainstream market. But they feel that natural products, eco-friendly products can still be made very pocket-friendly for consumers because they want to deliver the best to consumers without having to cost too much of the money for consumers. So they decided that uh, ingredients can be grown locally, which is what they did. And this sunflower uh, beauty oil itself is one of their best-selling items that can be used not just on skin, even on hair itself to help with hydration, uh, help with anti-aging itself. So this brand is really successful because they keep their products affordable while using very high quality and natural ingredients to formulate that. Not just that, um, they are also... Um, socially responsible in a sense. They focus on being pro-Philippines, uh, helping the uh, less fortunate to have the opportunity to work for them, to help them with product development, to help them with the making of all these products itself. So they resonate very closely with the consumers, um, not just in Philippines, but ultimately as they gradually expand, they have also um, penetrated into the international market like US, Canada and even the uh, Middle East market. We want to further look at some of the new product launches within the uh, Southeast Asia itself. Now, we understand that Korean trend has been a big thing within the beauty industry. But because Southeast Asia is a very diverse uh, region altogether, it's, it's not completely all leaning towards um, Korean trends. We will see very interesting um, opportunities that sits within the product landscape itself because consumers in Southeast Asia are also looking at Western brands, Japanese brands, um, and even like what I mentioned earlier on, we'll cover a little bit about the halal beauty trend. And so we will also be identifying the opportunities within Southeast Asia in this uh, product offerings itself. So when we talk about the skincare and makeup regime in uh, Southeast Asia, it's still very much kept very simple. Uh, keeping to really the essential products that we really need like the cleansing products, lotion, serum, moisturizer and of course with mask being such a, a big hype in the, today's industry of course mask has become a uh, part and puzzle of the skincare routine for consumers. A survey was done in Singapore by Daily Vanity, an uh, e-based uh, magazine in Singapore. So they realized that um, a large percentage of uh, women in Singapore, they are still very much leaning towards the Korean beauty culture and trends. But when it comes to women after 35 years old, they actually look up to Japanese beauty trends and beauty kind of uh, skincare products. When we look at color cosmetics within um, Southeast Asia, a lot is focusing on um, point makeup other than the normal face cosmetics. We will start to see more of like the lip colors, um, eyebrow liners or even eyeliners trending within Southeast Asia. 
what's interesting to note is actually the pick up on the face primer starting to actually resonate with our local, uh, our Southeast Asia consumers because the formulation for face primers is starting to offer more of the skincare benefits which give consumers a reason to actually use face primer in addition to what they normally use like foundation itself. Based on the Mintel's uh, global new product database where we track the new product launches um, within Southeast Asia, so we look across the um, subcategories of the beauty and personal care categories from 2014 to 2016 itself. So we see for each country, apart from the face and neck care kind of products, we see that the lip colour cosmetics, the lip colour category is actually picking up really quite quickly within the Southeast Asia itself, represented by the uh, orange bar itself. And interestingly, what we notice is that Indonesia and Malaysia in particular, they account for the most number of lip colour product launches uh, within Southeast Asia. And this is largely because um, they have a large Muslim community. And for Muslim communities, for Muslims who actually wear hijabs, lip colour cosmetics will be most ideal for them to actually enhance their uh, facial features itself. When we look across the categories growth year on year, so we see that of course lip colour is trending. Not just that, we also realise and see that the eyebrow products and category is starting to pick up within Southeast Asia itself. So when we talk about lip colour products itself, it accounts for more than half, about 64% of all cosmetic launches in 2017, which on its own is already a 14 percentage point increase from 2014 itself. So point makeup like eyebrow liners, eyelash products, um, it's really becoming popular because we need that, we need products like that to really further enhance our eye features for our Southeast Asian consumers. So we talk about point makeup being trending and we are seeing that even not just through products, but beauty services are popping up within Southeast Asia itself. We are starting to see more of the uh, eyebrow salon, eyelash extension salon uh, happening within Southeast Asia. So brow services like threading, uh, bo uh, boy embroidery itself is actually on the rise as we become more conscious about enhancing our facial features. We want convenience with nicely drawn eyebrows. So we are going for this kind of uh, eyebrow embroidery to give us the semi-permanent uh, effect where we actually save our time on our overall makeup routine. Lash extension is the recent trend within Southeast Asia. It's also starting to spread towards uh, Philippine markets, um, towards the Japan market itself, and it's becoming more and more affordable, ranging between $80 to about $200. So some of the popular brow salons is like Brow House, um, Benefit Brow Bar itself, that offers this kind of uh, services, and they are present not just in one market, they are present across Southeast Asia. So with a lot of our product launches in the beauty industry, we are, we are recognizing how fast-paced the industry has become and really what are, what are being launched and where are products being launched in the market. Singapore is becoming a key anchor for a lot of our product launches within Southeast Asia. So a lot of beauty brands are choosing to actually make their first debut in uh, Singapore to further step foot into wider Asia. So these are some of the key launches in Southeast Asia in the last like six months uh, taking place. And a lot of the cosmetics launches are coming from the Western brands itself. And they are well liked for their very strong colours, very bold colours and even the, lip, uh, the matte lipsticks that is starting to become a key trend within Southeast Asia. Kat Von D was uh, launched in Singapore in 2016, just last year in Sephora. So their launch of the matte lipsticks was a big uh, event. It was a key event where there was overnight queue outside Sephora store just to meet the, found, uh, the, the founder itself and to really be the first few to actually buy the Kat Von D lip products. Matte Cosmetics also set up their flagship store in uh, Ion Orchard in Singapore. So it's a hybrid store that offers not just products, but also beauty services and a lot of uh, limited edition collections. And the most recent arrival was from Marc Jacobs. They launched their summer collection uh, in Singapore just in May 2017. So this summer collection um, is made of the key ingredient using coconut. So again, it's a very known ingredient within Southeast Asia, which has a very high potential to really uh, appeal to our consumers within Southeast Asia market. 
So within Indonesia itself, we we have mentioned and we have seen how product launches, uh, a lot are coming from the uh, lead products itself. And for Indonesia, definitely is one key uh, product that is frequently purchased by our consumers. 81% of the lead products are actually purchased by our consumers in uh, Indonesia in 2016. And below are some of the top five websites for consumers to actually buy uh, makeup itself, like Lazada, Matahari Mall. So again, we are starting to we are seeing how Indonesian consumers are really also going into the online platform to make purchases. Again, driving the e-commerce uh, platforms itself for brands to design very interesting shopping channels, uh, digital payments, and offers for consumers. So in a market like Indonesia, where there's a large population of Muslim community, halal lip color products will really dr further drive the uh, category itself for religion reasons to really bridge the gap between religion and beauty for consumers. So these are two very popular brands within uh, Southeast Asia, WADA as well as the Mata Tila. So these two brands, they are halal certified of course, and they have also launched an extensive range of lip color products in the market itself. So like WADA itself, they came out with this uh, liquid innovation where it gives a really nice soft and creamy uh, texture itself, not forgetting to formulate it with natural ingredients and vitamins. So it allows for very smooth application for consumers. Mata Tila actually came out with this dual ended lip color. So it's both uh, a matte and a glossy lip product in one uh, product itself. The color trend is really very much inspired by a Lombok kind of a culture where they look into combining the beauty of nature together with the culture of a Lombok. So it's a very uh, local kind of appeal for consumers in Indonesia. Not just cosmetics, when it talks about personal care, we are seeing the comparison between what women are using and what men are using uh, in terms of the facial skincare products as of 2016 itself. So of course, cleanser, moisturizer are the largely used products uh, for consumers in Indonesia. But what's interesting to note is uh, formats like soap and uh, facial wipes are actually very popular among the gentlemen in Indonesia. Now, soap is very popular in general across Indonesia because of its low price point. And facial wipes is gaining its popularity because it comes as a dry format. So it's useful for certain areas and cities of uh, Indonesia where access to water is slightly more limited than the uh, more developed cities of Indonesia. So facial wipes offer that kind of convenience for consumers in the country. When you look at the facial skincare product usage in Thailand, Moisturizer is a big thing for them. And in Thailand, um, a, a lot of the consumers are sitting in between uh, Korean trends and even the Japanese trend itself. But basically, in general, they keep their skincare routine um, very simple, not overwhelming. 40% of the Thai women, they actually follow a very simple skincare routine. So within the market itself, we see mainly the staple kind of uh, skincare products like cleanser, uh, moisturizer, or even very targeted uh, skincare treatment kind of products like acne products. So it's interesting to also see how BB cream is still very popular within uh, Thailand itself because in Thai consumers see BB cream very much as like uh, tinted moisturizers. So for them, um, it's basically like a little bit like a uh, foundation, except that it comes with a lot of uh, skincare benefits like hydrating or even anti-aging, sometimes even whitening kind of uh, products for them. So because of the love of uh, BB cream, BB formulation in Thailand, um, the local brands have also started to come up with a lot of very interesting BB cream innovations. So like what we see, the first one, Nami Makeup Pro, they came up with this uh, very innovative powder, which actually is a texture transformation from being a wet, uh, like a cream, to actually a powder formulation. So turning it into a powder formulation allows the, the oil to be absorbed by the powder, so it gives you a very nice, uh, smooth, matte skin finished for consumers. Miracle Water Drop, again, uh, using ingredients like the snail extracts to offer the kind of hydration. So it actually is formulated with a water-resistant kind of a formulation that can also protect consumers against UV rays, um, even like the blue light coming from computers, one of the important claims that we are hearing more within the beauty industry as well. And again, trying to partner up between sunscreen and foundation, they came out with this uh, sunscreen cream by Fuji brand. 
So containing uh, very natural ingredients like aloe vera, again, snail secretion kind of uh, extract to provide like a BB sunscreen. So a different kind of uh, product call out um, for this kind of local BB cream formulations in the market. And of course, very much inspired by Korean trends, the local brands are also coming out with very interesting cushion formulations, cushion products um, to extend from the love for BB formulations. So they have interesting ones from like white plankton. Uh, it's a matte cushion itself. So it gives again a cooling and mattifying effect on the skin. They even came out with the sculpting kind of a cushion product. Um, like what we see at the bottom uh, left itself is a sculpting highlight and shading cushion that offers also UV protection for consumers. They even have also the DD cushion, daily defense cushion that helps with um, repelling dust, uh, fine particles from the skin itself, even from like uh, the tobacco smoke from consumers. So very, a lot of uh, very interesting innovation taking place for the cushion products. So we see a lot of uh, inspiration coming not just from Korea, but when it comes to skincare, a lot of inspirations and ideas are also coming from the uh, Japan market itself. When we look at a country uh, like Vietnam within Southeast Asia itself, we are seeing that skincare, of course, is a big, uh, is a big category within the, South, uh, within the Vietnam market itself, followed by the soap and bath products. So we see that color cosmetics is not so much of a big trend within the um, Vietnam market. Local brands are very niche within the uh, Vietnam market itself because the packaging doesn't appeal to consumers today when consumers are more exposed to a lot of other product trends um, around, the, around the region, around the country itself. South Korean companies have been one of the most successful ones penetrating into the Vietnam market um, through entertainment or media platform. So this kind of uh, challenged the local brands to really keep up. And with the very limited numbers of uh, local manufacturers, um, local brands are really struggling to really keep up and that's where a lot of foreign companies have the opportunity to step foot within the Vietnam market itself. So we see across Southeast Asia, the product launches, um, lip color products, hair products, or even like the uh, skincare products trending within Southeast Asia. So we see new product launches with halal claims that suggest a very good potential for Southeast Asia market because of the... Um, large Muslim community that uh, Asia Pacific really has. About 62% of the world's Muslim actually lives within the Asia Pacific region. Not just that, in Indonesia, they are passing the halal product certification bill. So by 2019, all the products sold in Indonesia needs to be halal certified. So skincare actually stands a large percentage of the halal sector within Southeast Asia. But we are seeing actually the potential for hair care and also body care as the white space opportunity for product innovations. So in the market already, what's trending is all the skincare products, uh, cosmetics products. But we kind of uh, neglect this untapped area of the hair care category as well as the uh, soap and bath category that really offers opportunities and inspirations for, uh, for brands to really look into and explore. So these are some of the interesting products that we currently see that are still very niche in the market that really bridge the gap between uh, religion and beauty for consumers. So things like hair care products really formulating with uh, Muslim community in mind, especially women who wear hijab. So women who wear hijab actually face a lot of uh, hair care concerns um, like maybe sweaty scalp, uh, itchy scalp that can ultimately even lead to like, hair loss in the more extreme cases. So with a product like, um, like the Cool Hijab itself, it's a hair, organic hair serum. So it actually refreshes the, hair, uh, the scalp for consumers like the Muslim women. And it also promotes hair growth for uh, consumers like that. So even for non-Muslim community, this is still a good product to use because it refreshes the scalp and it's uh, something that not just um, people who wear hijab faces. A lot of general consumers will also encounter similar problems. And the whole concept of halal beauty is really uh, expanding itself because when we truly understand the concept of halal beauty, we understand that we are not talking about just religion re reason. Really, um, the concept of halal beauty is about purity, cleanliness of the ingredients. So it actually resonates and it sits in place with consumers who are in pursuit of uh, ethical lifestyle, um, eco-friendly kind of uh, products that they're looking for. And that's where halal beauty has that kind of potential to grow to reach out beyond the uh, Muslim community. More products like the Iba Halal Care. This is the first halal uh, hair care product from India. 
So again, uh, taking into con consideration for consumers who cover their hair, so specifically targeted for covered hair uh, consumers. Even for nail care, we are starting to see oxygen-based kind of uh, nail polishes. So this is what we call the uh, Uhu friendly kind of uh, nail care products that consumers can still wear and you know, still attend their Friday prayers uh, session itself. So oxygen formula allows water and oxygen to still actually pass through the nail polishes um, to reach the fingernails itself. So it is of course halal certified and uh, Uhu friendly for our Muslim communities. So with all that we have seen from the retail landscape as well as the product landscape itself, some of the key uh, points that we can take away from the opportunities that sits within Southeast Asia. Firstly, of course, from our retail landscape, we are looking at the e-commerce and the m-commerce kind of uh, potential itself. Southeast Asia, as we have seen from the uh, e-commerce market size projection, it has a huge potential for growth and it continues to welcome uh, new developments, new digital platforms, um, designs, even digital payment design entering the Southeast Asia market itself. Not just that, physical store is still keeping up with that. It's actually a leverage of technology for physical store as well to provide um, both physical store experience uh, for consumers as well as the convenience of shopping online for consumers. So really, Southeast Asia is really like a combination of uh, US and China. We sit in a very uh, ideal location to reach out to a lot of uh, consumers worldwide. And we can drive definitely a very interesting e-commerce and m-commerce model, just like some of the examples that we have seen early on in the presentation itself. So beauty brands can actually combine technology even within the store to actually provide um, to make shopping really convenient, to actually engage consumers within the store and while delivering that kind of uh, convenience like online shopping uh, for consumers to shorten the turnaround time for shopping for consumers. So brands can actually have more marketing channels today in this beauty industry, especially within Southeast Asia region. And we have mentioned that um, Southeast Asia is a huge region, it's a diverse region. The potential market that we are looking at today is ideally the Thailand and Indonesia market itself. It's not just the population size of the region. Uh, we are seeing very interesting retail developments, very fast-paced retail developments within the region of Thailand and Indonesia. And we also know these two key countries, they attract very high traffic, uh, tourism traffic within this country that can further increase the consumer outreach for brands' presence and ultimately re, uh, turning it into sales turnaround time. These two countries have the most aggressive and interesting local brands' developments as well. So these domestic brands remain very competitive uh, within their country itself and they are focusing really a lot on the low and middle income group of consumers. So it still allows for their own local developments while welcoming foreign brands to uh, expand their business within their country to drive overall the beauty landscape for both Thailand and Indonesia. Last but not least, we talk about the potential of halal beauty trend. So halal beauty and personal care market will definitely grow when consumers learn to understand the overall concept of halal beauty and to really want to follow the kind of ethical lifestyle. So it reaches beyond just, again, the Muslim community. And again, with e-commerce trend, we are also starting to see uh, even like subscription boxes that is catered for um, halal, halal, cosmet uh, halal e subscription boxes within the market itself, trying to share the concept and the story of halal through social media, through online uh, stories, to connect with consumers to really understand uh, the concept of halal beauty. So with this kind of uh, emotional messages uh, revolving around ethical lifestyle about the cleanliness and purity of ingredients, Halal Beauty itself will definitely has its potential to reach out to a wider consumer base beyond just um, the Muslim community. So that's that for today's presentation on the beauty opportunities in Southeast Asia. Some of the products that have, you have seen in this presentation is also available at our Innovation Zone. So we will similarly uh, run through some of the interesting product launches from Southeast Asia at our innovation zone itself. So if you want to have a close up feel and touch of some of the products that's featured in this uh, presentation itself, do join us at our innovation zone. Our next session is at 3 p.m. Or subsequently, the next day, we have also morning session at 11 a.m. itself. Yeah. Thank you very much.